So now let's talk about control of the knee motion during walking. So this graph will be helpful to you because it gives you the geometry of the limb at initial contact, foot flat, mid stance, terminal stance, and we know this is terminal stance because the pelvis is in front of the foot, pre-swing, and toe off relative to the ground reaction force vectors. And what we can see is essentially the knee joint center is posterior to the ground reaction force vector at initial contact, then it switches to being anterior, then it's in line, then it's posterior again, then it's in line, and then it's anterior again. So this should telegraph to you that the control of the knee is going to be complex, switching from knee flexion to extension in the sagittal plane several different times during the gait cycle. Okay, so now what we're going to do with the knee is we're going to take a slightly different approach just because there's so many switches in the knee joint moments and the angles are fairly complex. So what we're going to do is look at the angles first and then look more closely at the, the moments in the EMG data. Is, so, so let's focus on the angles. So at initial contact, it's near, the, the knee is near full extension. It quickly goes into peak knee flexion by of about 20 degrees just after loading response. There's loading response, so an early mid stance, we reached a peak of, of 15 of 20 degrees at about 15% of, of the stance phase. So then as we kind of now go, now we have rapid knee extension that peaks or gets to full extension right around 40%. So that's through mid stance and then halfway through um, terminal stance. And then we have a second event here in terms of motion. We have gradual knee flexion followed by rapid knee flexion. The gradual knee flexion occurs until the, the beginning of pre-swing, so 50%. And then we have rapid knee flexion that lifts the toe, gives us toe off, contributes to toe off, and then we have continued knee flexion through uh, early swing into mid swing, and then this knee flexion helps us clear the limb. Then after we get to that uh, peak knee flexion at about 60 degrees, that's about 60 degrees there, then we have rapid knee extension, and then we're ready for the subsequent heel strike. So some key features are zero degrees of knee flexion initial contact, 20 degrees of knee flexion, um, at about 15% of stance, early mid stance, zero degrees of knee position at 40% or halfway through terminal stance, and then peak knee flexion at mid swing um, at of, of about 60 degrees, and then return to um, and zero degrees of knee flexion in preparation for subsequent heel strike. So those are the key features that you're responsible for for gait. So now let's focus in on this loading response knee flexion that's occurring and see what controls occurring there. Okay, so here's the moments and what we want to focus in on is this first part of gait here, which is 10% to about 15% where the knee is going into flexion. And essentially what we notice is the knee flexors are the agonist till about 5% of the gait cycle. And then the knee extensors become the, the primary agonist up to it reaches its peak. And so let's look, take, we only have two muscle EMG patterns here. So we're gonna take a look at a more complex look at the, the EMG patterns here in a minute. So here we have the uh, medial hamstrings, lateral hamstrings, rectus femoris muscle, and then the vastus lateralis. We know that the hamstrings look pretty similar with high activation early in stance and then late in the gait cycle. And then we also have for the, for the quad, we have the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis muscle have really high activation early and then the rectus has this high activation in the middle of um, the gait cycle, just 
just past like toward pre-swing and that there's not much kind of activation here and the quadriceps or the vastus lateralis later. So the vasti muscles like medialis and intermedius tend to follow the, the vastus lateralis and then the rectus femoris stands out as having an activation that's toward the end of stance and the beginning of swing. So now let's just focus in on these two points. We're going to call this initial contact and then this second point here, we're going to call that um, uh, foot flat. And let's look at those two specifically. So essentially when we looked at the moment data, we saw that at this initial contact point, which corresponds to this picture, that the X, the internal moment was an inflection. So what we can see here is that the knee is extended and the ground reaction force is anterior to the knee joint center. And so there's an external extension moment. So our internal moments in flexion. And we can see there's high EMG activity here associated with that point of stance. And the quadriceps is co-contracting, but it's not kind of, you know, full gas pedal down here yet. So it's going to activate some more. And so then at this second point of stance, which is foot flat, you know, or the end of loading response that's associated with opposite toe off. This one right here, we can see that the ground reaction force is now switched. So we have the knee joint center here is anterior to the ground reaction force. So the external moment is flexing the knee. So the internal moment would be the quadriceps, which would oppose that. And then it also has to overcome the co-contraction here that we see from the hamstring muscles to kind of maintain stability and, and oppose that external moment. Now we're going to also pick up this last point here, which is like, so we said this is the end of loading response. And so now we're kind of in mid stance. So in mid stance, what's also happening is early on, we have to, that knee flexion peaks here, but then we have to rapidly extend the, the knee again. And so what we can see here is essentially this, this quadricep contraction is now going to you know, go from controlling and stopping this peak knee flexion to then initiating a concentric knee flexion. So essentially what we're going to end up with is a stretch shortening cycle and we'll see that in the joint powers. And so the, this remaining quadricep activation that's occurring up to 20% of the stance is causing the knee to extend. So if we kind of look at the graph again, you know, we've the angle graph, we can see the knees flexing to about 20%. And then as we get to, to, or to I'm sorry, to 15%, it peaks. And then we can kind of see the 20% mark here, that first half of mid stance, the knee starts to extend again. And the agonist that's extending the knee is the quadricep muscle. And then at about 20% of stance, the agonist switches to the knee flexors. So let's try to understand then this section of the, of the knee angle data where the knee is extending up to about 40%. Okay, so if we kind of look at the moment data and the EMG data that we have down here, we know that Essentially, the, the knee is now extending through this period and reaching a peak at 40%. So this is 10, 20, 30, 40. So it's right at this point that the knee is fully extended. And we can see the flexors are on. Okay, so they're the agonist. So we look down here at the different EMG patterns. We can say is that Essentially, the bicep femoris is not on, and neither is the medialis because we know it follows that. The, the vasti muscles are not really co-contracting after 30%, and essentially the, um, the anterior tib is, doesn't act at the knee, but then the, um, the soleus muscle here kind of mirrors the gastroc, so we can kind of think of this as gastroc EMG here. And so we could see that essentially the gastroc 
um, is probably the agonist that's contributing to this this uh, moment that's being generated at the knee. So what we could say is essentially is we know that the from 15% to 40% here, essentially that the the quadriceps is initiating that knee extension, but then the EMG suggests that the gastroc muscles are basically keeping the um, controlling the amount of knee extension that occurs as we go from 20% uh, to 40% of the gait cycle. Now, the other thing that's happening is after we hit 40%, as we go from 40% to 50%, so getting ready for pre-swing, so as we go through that late part of terminal swing, we know that once we reach that peak knee extension, that we need something to initiate knee flexion. And so the gastroc then is now concentrically contracting to kind of help us initiate that knee flexion up to about um, the beginning of pre-swing. And we can kind of see that here that the, now the moment is going to switch again um, to the extensor. Okay, so now what we want to do is study the, the angle pattern again. So we've, we've kind of taken ourselves through this initial contact with the knee fully extended to peak knee flexion at 20 degrees. And then we've gone from knee flexion to a knee extension again. Then we initiated knee flexion here with the gastroc muscles. You can kind of see that in a moment data here. So now we're gonna now we're gonna take it from pre-swing where we're just getting you know slow knee flexion or this rapid knee flexion up to about 60 degrees of knee flexion during mid-swing. Okay, so what's controlling all of that? Well, first we could see here is that the it's we have a extensor agonist, and then we look down here at the vast eye and the different uh, muscle groups, and we can see really there's there's no extensor here that we can identify that would be responsible for this agonist activity, and so. If we look though carefully at the rectus femoris muscle, and we'll kind of talk about this at the hip too, we'll note that the rectus femoris is going to be responsible, um, does have EMG activity that corresponds to this pre-swing phase because we have 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, and 60 So this is pre-swing here, that during that pre-swing phase and then even early into initial swing. So this is 70, and we know that the transitions when the feet are adjacent around 73% of stance, we know that throughout this period we can get EMG from the rectus femoris muscle that then would kind of control the, the amount of knee flexion that's occurring. And so essentially what's flexing the knee, you might ask, and so let's try to explain that now. Okay, so, so some of you might have been surprised that essentially that from this 50% to this peak at 60 degrees, that the control was really the quadricep muscle when the knee's flexing. And so the question might arise is like, okay, we know that this initiation of knee flexion came from the gastroc, but what's causing the knee to flex here? And so essentially, it's, it's, we're going to say that this whole phase of knee flexion then together with this knee extension is really caused by the hip. So essentially we can kind of imagine it this way. So we'll take this first half of swing first. So if my knee starts in a relatively straight position here and then I rapidly flex the femur, but I don't have any or much muscle contraction at the knee, gravity will continue to push the knee down, right? And so essentially the knee will flex really with no muscle contraction. So what we're learning is that we need some amount of control of knee flexion. So we basically get this uh, agonist activity of the uh, rectus femoris muscle, which helps us 
control the amount of knee flexion that occurs due to inertia. So inertia is essentially causing the knee to flex. So rapid hip flexion ends up with this rapid knee flexion that's then controlled by the rectus femoris muscle. So then at 60 degrees, or right around the you know the mid swing beginning of mid swing the hip flexion starts to decrease so now we have this knee that's flexing this way because the hip was going forward but now i stop the knee the hip from flexing so the hips just flex it's not moving so then essentially what happens is the, the knee now, the tibia now swings the other way and extends. And that's essentially because the femurs stopped moving. So now the motion at the tibia switches in the opposite direction. And so the knee, the, the tibia starts extending. And so what we'll kind of see here is when we look at the EMG in the moments, is we're going to see that the the um, what we're going to see is that the the knee flexors then kind of gradually turn on to to slow down or stop this knee uh, extension that's occurring in terminal swing. So let's have a look at that. So so here's our knee flexion moment. And this is terminal swing. So this is this is sixty percent here. So seventy. 80, 90, and 100. And we can see that as we kind of transition into terminal mid-swing and terminal swing, we have this gradual um, agonist contribution of the knee flexors, and that essentially the knee, we see this increasing hamstring activation. Um, and then that is going to now get us ready for our subsequent heel strike. Okay, so as we imagine, Thinking about all of this, we can kind of put this together by looking at the um, concentric eccentric contractions indicated by the power curve. So essentially we have all of these different bursts. And so we have this initial Ka burst here. So this is the power curve, which is saying that there's a concentric contraction. We know because the agonist is the is in flexion and that the EMG shows us that the hamstrings are active, that this is a concentric hamstring contraction. And then now we can go to the K1 um, peak here. And so we can see that essentially there's a negative power. So this means there's an eccentric contraction. So it's from about 5% of the gait cycle to 15% of the gait cycle. So we'll just mark it up here in the angles. There's a eccentric contraction of the quadricep muscle because we know the agonist is an extension and we saw the Basti EMG a minute ago. So we know essentially this is eccentric control to this peak knee flexion. And then the K2 burst here is concentric because it's positive power. So we know as we go from here to about 20%, so this 5% of the gait cycles associated with this K2 burst, power burst, which is a concentric contraction of the quad. So we have a stretch shortening cycle from the eccentric contraction of the quads here, controlling this knee flexion, and then immediately followed by a concentric contraction. And then now we have, as we get into this kind of rapid knee extension that's occurring up until about 40% of stance. This is 10, 20, 30, 40% of stance. We can see the agonist here is the knee flexors, which we attributed to the gastrocnemius muscles. And we can see here that this is now an eccentric kind of burst here. which I don't have labeled here on the left, but that's eccentric gastrocnemia. So I do have a 
there to control this knee uh, extension that's occurring. And then from 40% to 50% here, KB here is the gastrocnemius concentric burst that initiates this knee flexion up to about 50%. And then we have this large K3 eccentric burst here, which we attribute to the rectus femoris muscle, which then kind of trails off. And so and what you can see is that the hip flexion is going to occur really rapidly. That hip flexion is going to cause knee flexion by inertia. And so just to kind of slow that down, we need this kind of quick burst from the rectus femoris muscle to kind of keep the right amount of uh, angular velocity of knee flexion. So we kind of peak right here at 60 degrees um, just after the end of um, initial swing. And so as we kind of get into mid swing here, then we have like very little power. So we're just kind of hanging out here in the middle because the, the inertia is what's, what's gonna swing the limb now back into extension. And then we see this large K4 burst, which is really um, a eccentric um, contraction of the hamstring muscles to control this kind of rapid knee extension that's occurring here in mid and terminal swing. So this is 90%. There's 80, and then there's 100. And that sets us up for a subsequent heel strike. Okay, so let's try to use this information to identify um, what's abnormal about this, the knee, you know, this same um, picture that we did for the ankle. So essentially, if we kind of identify the period of gait first, so we can kind of see whether they're in double support, and the toe is about to come off on the opposite limb, so we're really at the end of the loading response. So at the end of the loading response, we would expect the knee to be near full flexion, about 20 degrees of flexion, and it's extended. So that's abnormal. Okay, we would expect it to be um, flexed, basically. So we could do the same here. We can kind of look at the period of gait and so say, okay, so here's uh, the stance limb, so left limb in this case. The opposite limb is anterior, so they're past uh, mid uh, initial swing, so they're into mid swing on the opposite side, and the heel is about to come up. And so, in this particular case, we'd expect it to be, you know, 35, about 35 percent of stance. So we can say that right here, we're right in here. So there's 30 percent here. And then, so we're somewhere in here. So the knee is fully extended. So at this, for this particular frame, the knee is normal. Okay. So we've already looked at the angles and asked if it's normal. So let's ask if the moments are normal. So we can kind of put the center of mass here and then kind of project the center of pressure anterior to the ankle because we're thinking that the foot's fully in contact. And we can draw a representative ground reaction force vector there. We put the knee joint center here. So we notice that the external moment is toward extension. And so that means the internal moment would be toward flexion. So we can kind of see that at the initial contact point, because we're we think we're right, we're right over here, the end of loading response. And so we should really have an extension moment at this time. So this is abnormal. And so you know, so this is abnormal, and the quadriceps are not being recruited as they might. not recruited. Okay. 
So now let's go to this next picture and do the same kind of process. We've already talked about the angles. Now let's talk about the moments. And so we know that the ground dimension force vector is here. Here's a center mass now. It's a little bit more forward, but not too forward of the knee. So here we have our external VGRF, our joint center. So our external moment is an extension, and our internal moment is in flexion. And so if we go to this part of the gait cycle, we said it's about 35%. And so if we go here, we can see that the internal moment is flexion. And then we have an internal moment that's flexion. So that's pretty normal for that part of the gait cycle. OK, so some key take home points. So the first key point we talked about last time for the ankle is that at 15% of the gait cycle, the tibia has to be stable so that the femur can rotate into this vertical position we see here. And so essentially what rotates that femur into this vertical position is a contraction of the quadricep muscle and the gas, uh, gluteus maximus muscles. And so essentially during this period of stance from 15% to 30%, you can kind of see this this rotation of the femur to a more vertical position accomplishes a lot of forward progression for the trunk. So it's a key point of, of functional gait if they are getting good um, integration of forward velocity. They'll balance themselves quickly during that loading response, go into single leg support and then be able to take advantage of this rotation of the femur because the tibia is stable to achieve forward progression. So just as some tips um, for the knee, there's a lot of different uh, changes in the moments and powers for the knee. It's obviously the most uh, complex of the three joints we'll cover. Um, so the, the more systematic you can be, the better. Um, please ask lots of questions. Um, as we kind of move on to the, uh, please ask lots of questions and um, study the graphs.